The following NBC Sports program is brought to you in living color. Your Dodge dealer invites you to see the beautiful all-new Monaco for 74. And by Gillette, makers of new Track 2 twin injector blades for the best injector shave of your life. The temperature, 50 degrees in New York. A brisk breeze blowing. The weatherman said there might have been a chance of rain. It hasn't, and neither team took fielding or batting practice. Ladies and gentlemen, last night we saw a rare moment in World Series history. Two standing ovations for a reserve obscure infielder by the name of Mike Andrews. Mike Andrews did not have a job in the middle of the summer. After being picked up by the Oakland A's, he was sent home packing last Sunday night. Well, it's, it's been an experience, I think, that Mike Andrews will always wonder about. And you know, we read about the horrifying crimes in the streets and we have a nation of knockers, it seems, sometimes. Also, quality and substance nowadays seem to be scoffed at and unappreciated. But I think last night, Mike Andrews found out how decent people can really be. First of all, his own teammates stood solidly behind him. And then the enemy, the enemy crowd, the New York Met fans, who were vilified for their actions here in Game 5 against the Cincinnati Reds, proved to be warm and understanding. Typically, New York sports fans have always rooted for the underdog. And last night, they rooted for Mike Andrews. The standing ovation Mike Andrews will always ponder about and wear a secret smile the rest of his life. Tonight's starting pitchers, Vita Blue for Oakland, Jerry Kuzman for the Mets, both left-handers. Lindsey Nelson, what's the condition of Cleon Jones? He was doubtful just before game time. Curdy has the flu. They've decided he is going to play. We saw him night before last with an upset stomach on the field. We saw him leave the game last night with the flu. He hasn't eaten any solid food in two days. He was examined by the doctor tonight. He's weak. He's not 100%, but he's going to play. Well, you broadcast the Mets here since 62. You went through many a lean year till the Mets finally made it in 69. Now back in the World Series again. Anything surprise you about the Mets in this series? Yes, there is something. It's their run scoring ability, their ability to hit the long ball. I'm not surprised by their pitching. They got here on pitching. They got here on good defense, but they have been able to score more runs than I ever dreamed they would. It's been a crowd that's been enthused here, the same in Oakland. Anytime you have World Series, you have excitement, hilarity, a sense of good feeling. But sometimes it isn't always that way with everyone. Last year, a sad sight to see Reggie Jackson on crutches. And this year, Bill North, the regular center fielder of the Oakland A's, has not been able to play in this series. And before the game, Tony Kubek taped an interview with the A's center fielder. Bill, this past season for the Oakland A's, you uh, stole over 50 bases. You batted 280 plus. You scored 98 runs. You had a whale of a year. You're not in the World Series. Now, Perhaps you can explain for our fans why you're not on this World Series roster. Well, I hurt my ankle and I was in a cast for about two and a half weeks. And then I came out of the cast and I went through a bunch of therapy and stuff and they got my ankle in pretty good shape, but it got down to a thing where they didn't feel a couple of people, namely Finley and Williams, didn't feel that I could do enough and that it wouldn't be uh, beneficial to my well-being, I don't know, health-wise, and and could you play team. right now if you had to? I think I can. I I feel good. My ankle hasn't hurt me in a week. Man. All right, you've uh, you've had a chance to watch the series, the Mets, your Oakland A's team. What are some of your observations about your own team and the Mets? Well, our team, uh, we're not getting the long ball the way we should. It, you know, it's it's a funny kind of thing. But we went through a couple of streaks like that this year where we didn't get a long ball for a week or so. You know, and the Mets, they're I really don't think they're as good a team as we are but then not always the best team wins and I'm not going to say that they win but they've been won a couple of games and and they scrap and they're a tough team and they come out and fight you you know and sometimes emotion are better is better than physical ability Bill, you don't seem very happy to be an active at World Series time it's always a, a great time of the year for a player and for the fans and you seem like you're a little bit dejected not being able to play yeah because I don't know I, I think that I could do something to help the team and I uh, and since I can, it's kind of frustrating, but I've been staying away mostly, so, you know, it's all right. Bill North, maybe next year. Yeah. Thank maybe. you for coming out. Let's go back upstairs. 
during the last day of the play. Here is the manager of the A's, number 23, Dick Williams. Batting first and playing shortstop, number 19, Bert Campaneris. Batting second and playing left field, number 26, Joe Rudy. Batting third and playing third base, number six, the captain of the A's, Sal Bando. Batting fourth and playing center field, number nine, Reggie Jackson. Batting fifth, playing first base, number 18, Gene Tennis. Batting sixth, playing right field, number 22, Jesus Alou. Batting seventh, the catcher, number 10, Ray Fossey. Batting eighth, playing second base, number one, Dick Green. Batting ninth and pitching, number 14, Vita Blue, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the Oakland A's. Here is the manager of the Mets, Yogi Berra. Batting first and playing third base, number 11, Wayne Garrett. Batting second and playing second base, number 16, Felix Millan. Batting third, playing right field, number four, Rusty Staub. Batting fourth, playing left field, number 21, Cleon Jones. Batting fifth, playing first base, number 28, John Milner. Batting sixth, the catcher, number 15, Jerry Grody. Batting seventh, playing center field, number 25, Don Hahn. Batting eighth, playing shortstop, number three, Bud Harrelson. Batting ninth and pitching, number 36, Jerry Kuzman, who is warming up in the bullpen. And here are the remaining players and coaches of the New York Mets. Ladies and gentlemen, with us this evening is the Armed Forces Police Color Guard and the 590th United States Air Force Band of the East from McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. The national anthem this evening will be sung by Tony Martin. And now to honor America, let us all join in singing our national anthem. Oh, say can you see dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight all the ramparts we watch was so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof to the night that our flag was still there oh say
NBC will bring you the fifth game of the 1973 World Series and the ceremonial first pitch right after this message. We direct your attention to the commissioner's box adjacent to the Mets dugout. We are honored this evening to have with us to throw out the first ball, one of the greatest players in baseball history, Joe DiMaggio. Joe, who played in 10 World Series, had eight home runs. Probably weighs about a pound and a half more now than when he played. One of the most beautifully groomed men in baseball history. I think he's better looking now, Lindsay, than he was one of the players. I think he's by far more distinguished looking than he ever was in his life. Joe D. He was on with us. Field, playing the carom off the screen very well. Then I'm sure after trying to recover from about with a flu, pretty wobbly leg. And suddenly a big streamer is coming out. Looks like a giant pink snake flying over the infield. Kurt, over the years, I've seen almost everything here at Shea. A giant pink snake wouldn't surprise me at all. The way they uh, used to play in the early years, there are a lot of people I think saw snakes and pink elephants here, didn't they? Jones at second, nobody out. John Miller, the batter, a strike to him. Miller is five out of 16. He's batting 313. That double by Cleon Jones was his second. Well, the Mets are threatening now. Runner at second. Nobody out. No score in the game. Right with a wicked fastball. Nothing in two. Talking about Vita Blue on the road. His record at Oakland this year, eight wins and six losses. On the road, he won 12 and lost three. The right. Here's Jones coming in to score. And the Mets lead one to nothing. There's just no doubt that almost throughout this series, the Mets have been more aggressive with the bats. Absolutely, Tony. They've been more aggressive, and this is one of the things I'm told that has bugged the A's, the fact that the Mets have been able to go out in front early in so many ball games, something they did not expect at all. Second RBI of the series for John Miller. Brody can go to right field. Let's see if they put a hit and run on. They haven't been trying to steal, but they have been playing some hit and run, and successfully, too. Stop executed. An adroit hit and run play last night. Fly center field. Reggie Jackson drifting back. One down. Milner holds it first. Don Hahn, three out of 18, batting 167. Leon Jones draped in a blanket to keep him warm. Playing with a flu. It came up in the second to lead off with a double. One to nothing, New York. Last of the second. Back one. John Milner at first, one out. Now 
all the way. Strike two. Well, the Mets have scored first in all three games here at Shea Stadium. The A's got on the scoreboard first in the two games out at Oakland. Every team likes to get on the scoreboard first. They can gamble more. Play some hit and run, steal, take chances. A ball. The other team has to play catch up. By the blue with a one ball, two strike count to Don Hahn. Blue pitched in four games in the World Series last year. Three times in relief. Puts it to shortstop Campanaris. There's one, that's all. And we've been talking about Harrelson. A little tip of the hat to Bert Campanaris, who's been just as steady. They made all the plays, both of them. Watch Bert Campanaris again, a man who's become a very accomplished shortstop. The ball just out of the grasp of Sal Bando, sliding in the hole and a good, quick release to get the ball to Dick Green. Bud Harrelson switch hitting. He's a 400 batter in this World Series, six out of 15. The Mets are leading, one to nothing. Don Hans at first base, there are two outs. One thing that has surprised me about the A's pitching staff, with the exception of Catfish Hunter, is that Holzman Blue have not thrown many breaking balls. <coughs> Holzman has a good curve ball. Blue has come up with a pretty good hard curve, but they just aren't throwing it to these Mets hitters. Oh, you're right, Tony. They relied on the fastball. One ball, one strike. Most clubs are fastball hitting teams, too, in baseball. They don't like the old number two. One ball, one strike. High fly, deep to Rudy. He'll have room, though. The side's out. One run. Two hits, no errors, one left. End of two, Mets leading, one nothing. Does it appear to you that he stepped more home than he did toward first? Now look at him walk over toward first base to try and deceive the umpire. Watch Campy. All he had to do was lean. A pretty good bulk move by Jerry Kuzman, and he got away with it, picking off Campanaris. So at the end of two and a half innings, it's the New York Mets one, and the Oakland A's nothing. and that ball on its way. Campanaris looked like he touched it. Made a nice try. Hey, uh, Tony and Lindsay, the way he's hitting in this series with a bad shoulder, just reaching out and slapping the ball to left, maybe he'll get ideas of changing his style next year. Well, you know, he did that along in midseason because he couldn't pull and then pull late in the year. Jones goes around. Jones double the left first time up. One to nothing, New York ahead. They're batting in the last of the fourth. They have three hits, the A's have two hits. Dobbs on first, nobody out. Well, we're in the fifth game. Rusty Staub already has eight hits. Yogi Berra likes his style. The World Series record is 13 hits. Held by Tony's close friend and former roommate Bobby Richardson in 64 and Lou Brock in 68. And it's a face hit up the middle. Staub is stopping at second. Leon Jones, he should have the flu every night. He's two out of two. Last two nights, it's been a case of the walking wounded supplying a lot of the power. Dick Williams has West Stock as pitching coach on the phone right now, calling down the bullpen to get someone ready.
everybody's emerged out there. All right, the Mets have runners on first and second. Nobody out. They're ahead one nothing. John Miller, a pull hitter, he can hit the right and get those runners over. Unless he puts the butt down. And I think they had him hitting away. One ball, no strike. He'll try and get that ball, slap it to right or hit it to right field. Move those runners on. Time is called. Cleon Jones tying his shoelace at first base. Raleigh Fingers, who didn't work last night, is starting to warm up now for the A's. The A's don't want to go home behind, so they're, they're getting Fingers up early, the ace of their bullpen. They don't want to drop too far out of this game. One ball, no strike. No strike. The New York Mets in last place in July. Last place, I think, from June 28th into August. August 30th, as a matter of fact. At one time, they were 12 and a half games behind. They were. And they won the pennant. Beautiful bunt. Blue plays it to third. And only the athletic ability of Vida Blue kept that from being a successful sacrifice. One of the toughest plays in baseball for a third baseman and that catcher coordinating his play. Blew off very quickly, almost down the third base foul line. That play easier for a left-handed pitcher as he is moving in that direction. Does not have to whirl completely around like a right-handed pitcher to make a throw to third base. Blue really fielded his position well and got a good quick throw off to Bando. The Mets were 12 behind after the games of July 4th. And uh, tradition says that the team in first place on July 4th should be the winner of the pennant. But it doesn't work out that way. Always. Ball one. The Giants had a great rush in 51. They were 13 and a half behind in August. Mets were way behind in August, too. Eleven and a half games in August 5th. And won it. The Boston Braves were in last place in 1914, July 4th, the halfway mark. Won the pennant and swept the World Series from Connie Max A's in four games. Two balls, no strikes for Jerry Grody. Jones at second, Milner at first. Now what's the sign? Eddie Yost he used to be the walking man with the Washington Senators. I think eight seasons he walked over a hundred times. There's a pop. Gene Tennis will have room. And it's two down. I broadcast the Red Sox many years. Used to watch Eddie Yost play. Lindsay, he crowded the plate. And always had a habit of an inside pitch of uh, tucking his belly in to make it look like it was way inside. And they used to complain and complain, but he always got that ball four. <laughs> he he used did. To get, excuse me, Lindsay. He used to get up on his toes and a pitch around the knees. Anything up around the shoulders, he would <laughs> crouch. Oddly enough, deceptively, he had power and, and hit many leadoff home runs. Don Hahn up for the mess. Hit into a force play his first time. The Mets have runners on first and second. Two out. They're leading one nothing. Blue fires a fastball across. Raleigh Fingers continues to warm up. Rusty style. Sign here. I'm lusty for Rusty last night. <laughs> One strike. Foul right over our NBC booth. The Mets have one run, four hits. The A's, no runs, two hits. You're looking at the base runners. Milner at second. Jones a second, and owner for Mrs. Payson, the owner of the New York Mets. A two strike delivery, a foul ball again. No balls, two strikes to Don Hahn. 
The hitters who bat against Vita Blue as opposed to a couple of years ago when he was a Cy Young Award winner say he throws just as hard at times, but apparently his ball does not move around in the strike zone, not as lively. It's, it is straighter. Up high with a fastball. One ball, two strikes. Jones at second. Melner at first. Two out. Don Hahn played to the opposite field except for Rudy, who straight away and left for him. Definitely hit the cap and there for Fuchsia. And the Mets had the base were loaded. Campaneris overran that ball. The ball got on Campy much more quickly than he thought. He didn't get a chance to get down on the ball. See, he's caught in between his hop as he tried to plant that right foot. Fortunately, he was able to knock it down with his glove, preventing a run from scoring. An error charged to Campaneris. That's Campanera's first error of the series. And the eighth error for the Oakland A's. The Mets have made six errors. Base are loaded. Harrelson up. Harrelson pops it up. Gene Tennis waving his arm out. Got it, and he does. The Mets had no... collision. Neither one heard and now an off balance throw that nearly gets Gene Tennis coming back in. Watch again as Staub and Mian after Mian throws the ball. Near collision and they've had enough injuries on this team all season long. They don't need another one. Who says there's no action in baseball? <laughs> Crowd applauded Mian's grab and Milner's hustling dive for first base. Where he smothered his uniform in the dirt. Dick. Dick Green fly to center his first time. Two down for the A's. Gene Tennis still on first. The A's are trailing one to nothing. There's a high fly out to deep center. Don Hahn settling under it. And that's it. No run. No hits, one left. We're halfway through, and the score, Mets one, A's nothing. And a situation like this. Blue just cut it loose a little too far. Fossey could not get up. He made a good try to stop it. Dick Williams maybe thought he had picked up a signal from Eddie Oast, but he didn't. It scored as a wild pitch, and here comes Wes Stock, the pitching coach, out to the mound now to talk to Vida Blue. We're going to get some action down in the bullpen of the Oakland A's. They get Raleigh Fingers up again. Raleigh Fingers is up and throwing for the second time tonight. That's he. Runner at second, one man out on a 1 0 count. To me on at the plate. The Mets got there running the second inning. And Cleon Jones double. John Milner singled him home. Ground ball to the right side, taken at first base by Tennis. He slips down, gets up, goes unassisted. Moving to third. On the infield out is Wayne Garrett, and Rusty Staub is coming up. Rusty Staub, a young fellow who has invested in a raft of businesses in Montreal where he was known as La Grande Orange, has an apartment in New York where he plays, is a native of New Orleans where he frequently visits his parents, and his legal address is Houston, Texas. <laughs> Yogi Berra. Two men out, runner at third. Mets are batting in the bottom of the fifth inning. 
Dick Williams. That's in for a call strike to Rusty Starr. One delivery. Fouled it off and out of play. 0 oh and 2. I think a stop as we look at Garrett at third is a great study for young kids who might be looking in with that sore, sore shoulder just chopping away at the ball. He's still hitting the ball hard, hitting it with authority. You don't have to swing hard. This is his 11th professional year and it's his first World Series and he was the hero of last night's game and believe me he savored every moment of it. Ground ball is short. Gapanaris over to tennis, and the side is out. So. Watch Bert again, just trying to draw an errant throw from Grody, faking he wasn't going at all. Look at Stop. He'll push him off the bag. So there are two men out and Sal Bando is up as Campaneros lengthens out his lead now and Kuzman throws over there again. Two men out, two men on. The Mets are leading one to nothing. Oakland batting in the top of the sixth inning. It breaks low and away and it's ball one. He climbed the wall with a leaping grab. This was an even better catch. It was that. He took one away from Don Hahn last night, and this one, he really pulled in. Well, he makes it in the World Series in Cincinnati last year in the opening game. A leaping grab up the wall. Reggie Jackson giving him a little kidding out there. Joe Romo, the trainer. Some of the bullpen boys coming out. Daryl Knowles in the jacket. Raleigh fingers to see if he's all right. Look like he, it might be his left wrist. Might have been very lucky that it is not a concrete or a wooden wall out there, and that screen may have eased the, the burden a little bit or the onus of that blow. Jones really cracked it. It appeared like it was going out of the ballpark at first. Rudy playing a little bit shallow, and then the ball started sinking. Had that top spin. What a great play. The play of the series so far. Fortunately, he did not hit the fence head on. Here's another angle. Going into that fence at a little bit of an angle. No chance to break his speed. Curtis. Here's the whole play again. I think when he smacked his left hand, this is from the center field camera, coming at you now. And watch him. When he hits the iron fence out there on the screen, pushing his left hand to brace himself up against the fence is where he might have been in trouble. Look at him, how he reached over and hit that left hand against the fence. And that might have put some pressure on his wrist. John Milner's at the plate now. He drove in the med run in the second inning. He's one for two. Your attention, please. I'm calling. They're going to ask that a banner be removed down in the right field corner. That one is in fair territory, so they're going to ask that it be pulled in. Lindsay, I saw one banner tonight in back of the A's dugout. When Dick Williams came out, he held it up and said, Yankee, go home. <laughs> Williams is rumored, you know, of going to retire from the A's and become the next manager of the Yankees. Some of these banners. That left center field. Up the alley, Brody's around second. He will score, he's getting a green light at third. Brody's coming home and Hans on the way to third. Brody scores a triple, a run that it ends the match for leading by a score of two to nothing. Lindsay, it continues to surprise me that these A's play Hans to the opposite field. Jackson was playing shallow, way over in right side. It's fingers and nose in the bullpen. And if it's one thing we've learned about Dick Williams, it is that he does not waste very much time in doing whatever he does. 
There have been three balls hit hard off blue this inning. Jones robbed of a hit on that sensational catch by Rudy. Then uh, Jordy single, now Hans triple, and Blue again has lost it in the sixth inning. A break in the action here at New York with a score. <laughs> the eight didn't have many hits tonight, three, but they've drawn six walks. Jesus Alou, a pretty good first ball, fastball hitter, so McGraw's going to have to make a good pitch or will try to anyway. Dick Williams. Let me check those walks, Lindsay, that ran down my scoreboard. Seven walks. What are we going to see? A pinch runner? Is that what Williams is waiting for? Apparently so. He's set for something or somebody. <laughs> Umpire Russ Getz would like to know what he has in mind. Dick Williams, a great believer in making things happen. I think unlike Yogi, who sits back a little more patiently and waits, many times they will use Odom to pinch run in situations such as this. He has already used Alan Lewis. It looks like Blue Moon right there. Yeah, John Odom. Good runner, Odom. Williams thinking obviously an extra base hit Odom may have a better chance scoring all the way from first base instead of tennis but Williams could also get himself in trouble should this ball game be tied by them with tennis out of the game. So Odom checks in with coach Jerry Adair at first base. Tennis is out of the ball game. Jesus Alou at the plate. Two men out. Two men on. Stone still throwing in the bullpen. The Mets are leading two to nothing. In there for a call strike. cameras over in the NBC radio booth at Jim Simpson on your left Monty Moore the A's broadcaster on the right they're broadcasting radio around the world tonight and Monty will join us Tony and me in Oakland for game six on television and now the New York Mets come up in the bottom of the eighth inning Pat Burke is in the ball game at first base John Milner is at the plate for the Mets Drove in the first run in the second inning. He is one for three. As a base hit in the center field. A leadoff single as Reggie Jackson returns it. There is Pat Burke coming over to hold against the runner. Tennis, you'll recall, was removed for the pinch runner. Mets lead 2 nothing now, and Jerry Grody's coming up. One for three. One would expect the Mets to try to build a run here in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Jordy's around, bunched the ball, first base side, a foul ball. Ray Fossey got to it in foul territory. It's strike one to Grody. Milner back to first base. You're right, he does have a lot of Henry Aaron's mannerisms, just jogging back to first as he just did. He does that. That's why they call him the hammer. Always call him the hammer until the time when the Mets play the Atlanta Braves. And then for some reason they don't call him the hammer in that series. Grody's around. Watch this one fair. Burke has it. Goes to Kubiak. Sacrifice goes 3 4 if you're scoring, and it has moved Milner to second base. It'll bring up Don Hahn, who tripled the drive and a run in the sixth inning. Was on on an error by Campanaris in the fourth, grounded into a force play in the second. Center field has been a problem spot for these Mets most of the season until this fella came along. 
Center field has been a problem spot for the New York Mets most of their life. right off the end of the bat, strike one. Jackson in center field this time is not playing over in right center field as he has most of this series. He's moved about straight away. And right now, with Hahn at the plate, the Mets have out hit the A's 52 hits to 35 hits of the four games. That's 17 more hits. Curve ball swung on and missed, 0 and 2. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. This is Lindsey Nelson with Kurt Gowdy and Tony Kubek at Shea Stadium in New York, where the Mets are leading the Oakland A's by a score of 2 to nothing. Bottom half of the eighth inning. Two strike delivery. Rides high. It's 1 and 2. One man out, a runner at second. Paul Lindblad is up and throwing in the bullpen now for the Oakland A's. That's Lindblad. He was the winning pitcher night before last in an 11 inning game. Now the one, two. Swung on and missed. Struck him out. Two away. And the batter will be Bud Harrelson. And the A's fans might be looking ahead, Lindsay. The A's had the bottom third of their order up in the ninth inning. Fossey, Kubiak, and Fingers. First base is open. Tug McGraw follows in the batting order. An intentional walk has been ordered by manager Dick Williams. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they make that pitcher throw all four. That was close. Was that? I'm trying to make this intentional <laughs> pass exciting. It's not very easy. I was about to say, <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy at all. So, it is accomplished at least. <laughs> McGraw, good hitter. No, as a matter of fact, he isn't at the start of the year. He was a switch hitter and finally gave it up. Doug McGraw coming up. Well, he came well prepared. I hope that was not a real wolfskin coat. Whoever drops a cigar ash in that baby will be <laughs> running for the exit. <laughs> McGraw, I suppose, could be best characterized as a hitter as tenacious. Everything he does. He does in that manner. Fouled it off, and it's strike one. We've seen great pitching in this ball game so far. Kuzman, McGraw in relief. Fingers has looked sharp. By the blue pitch well. Breaking pitch in for a call strike. It's 0-2. Milner's the runner at second base, and Bud Harrelson is the runner at first base. Two men out. The dust blown across the infield. Fastball hit on the ground to second. Kubiak is up over the first in time. Decided to retire. There was a hit and a walk, two left, and at the end of eight, the score is the Mets two, Oakland nothing. Hi, I'm Al Kaline. I'm in my 20th season with the Detroit Tigers, and I've enjoyed every one of these years. Baseball has done a great deal for me and my family, more than I can ever repay. If you want a good life, like to travel first class, meet interesting people, and have a lot of fun while doing it, put your mind on baseball. Baseball is a great career. Preceding announcement made on behalf of Major League Baseball. A program note 
Academy Award winner Cliff Robertson and Robert Duvall stars Cole Younger and Jesse James in the great Northfield Minnesota Raid this week's Saturday night at the movies nine o'clock Eastern time eight central right here on NBC and the Oakland A's now are three outs away from dropping behind in this series they'll send up the bottom of their order against Tug McGraw who has relieved Jerry Kuzman remember game six will start in Oakland 330 our coverage Eastern Daylight Time. Tom Seaver and Jim Hunter in that game. Speaking of Jim Hunter, he's throwing in the bullpen at this moment for the Oakland A's as they come up here in the top of the ninth inning. That's Hunter. Ray Fossey will lead it off. He had a double in the seventh inning, and the pitch is high and away for a ball. You know, if he got in there, the A's tied this, but went into extra inning. Could mean they'd switch to Holtzman on Saturday. That pitch is high. He might start Blue Moon Odom too. A Blue Moon, nice. Holston was shelled early here in Shea Stadium. That's a call strike. It's two on the Mets have their bullpen going. A left hand to George Stone, a right hand to Harry Parker. There they are. Bullpen coach Joe Pignatano. Our guard delivers 2 1. And the left. Here comes Jones. Cleon Jones. Are they out? Leon has had a pretty good evening for a fellow who was a doubtful starter because of a case of flu. Our statistician here tonight, Alan Roth, production stage manager Jim O'Gorman. Sinking line drives. Cleon got a good jump. The ball hit almost directly at him. A tough play for any outfielder. You don't get that sideline perspective. Here he comes again from a different angle. Good catch, protecting so the ball would not get by him. There's a strike to Ted Kubiak. Last two A's have hit line drives, Alou and Bossy. That is strike two. Billy Canigliaro has come out on deck now. Billy C is on deck. Two strike delivery. Rides high, it's one and two. The A's. That's Billy C. Singing goodbye, Charlie. We hate to see you go. Just missed. It's two two. Now the Charlie and the A's are not folders. They'll be back Saturday. Don't worry. That one is a foul ball, and it's back out of play. You know, we've talked before about a lot of the moves that. Dick Williams has made. You've got Kubiak up there now in this situation. The ninth inning. Dick Green, a 260 hitter during the year, was taken out earlier in the ball game. Makes you wonder. 2-2. Two, two, foul back. He's still alive at 2-2. Two two. Dick Williams, West Stock. The Mets have had two runs, seven hits. Yogi Berra, Rube Walker, Eddie Yost. Brought the fastball in and caught him looking. That gets the Mets fans up on their feet here at Shea Stadium, and Billy Canigliaro will be batting now. Coming in to bat for Raleigh Fingers. You see Williams doing his bookkeeping there on his personnel chart on the back wall of the dugout. He's only got one man left back there. That's Davalillo. That's him for a call strike. They've had their chances. They left two in the sixth, three in the seventh, two in the eighth, but they couldn't get the big hit. Conversely, Yogi Berra has not been to his bench tonight, except for a relief pitcher. Scrooge breaks low, and it's 1 1. These are simply two managers with totally different philosophies about how you run a ball game. Each obviously is successful. They run the World Series. One on the fastball. It's one and two. And he wants to wind up with that Irish flair. A strikeout. Again, as we said before, if you see him get by and get this man out, there will be an emotional display that will surpass the previous one. Two men out. 
He's called out on sight. There is McGraw. <laughs> Tug McGraw finishing with successive strikeouts as he gets the save. And the win, of course, goes to Jerry Kuzman. And the New York Mets go out in front in the World Series, three games to two. Cleon Jones coming out of a sick bed, double single here tonight and turned in a spark and play in the outfield. Don Hahn had a triple to drive and a run. The Met fans have seen the final game of the season at Shea Stadium. And now the New York Mets at 4.15 tomorrow afternoon will be flying out of New York and heading for Oakland where game number six comes up on Saturday afternoon, coverage starting on NBC at 3.30. We'll be right back after this message. Well, the A's didn't get an earned run in the two games here. After they won the opening game, the Mets earned run average in their staff, 1.65, and McGraw completed five shutouts for the Mets pitchers during the season. Quick comments by Lindsay. Nice job here, Lindsay, Thank by the way. Thank you very much, Kurt. A great pleasure to work with you and Tony. Thought Cleon Jones had a great night. So did Kuzman, so did McGraw. Tony. Mets got what they did all during the stretch. Good pitching, good relief. Good hitting in the clutch. The Mets lead three games to two. Travel day tomorrow. We'll be covering the World Series Saturday for game six. Seaver against Catfish Hunter and we'll start it at 3.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you everyone for looking in. Game five of the 1973 World Series has been brought to you by Chrysler Plymouth. Featuring the beautiful new 1974 Chrysler's and Plymouth. And by Gillette. Makers of that dry look. Number one aerosol for men's hair. No wonder the wet head is dead. The Flip Wilson Show, Ironside, and Sammy Davis Jr., starring in NBC Follies, will return next week in their regularly scheduled time periods. And game six, beginning at 3.30 Eastern Time Saturday with the baseball world of Joe Garagiola, right here on NBC. Betty Davis. The 1973 New York Mets were a team that for most of the season looked like they were headed nowhere. By August 5th, they were 48-61 and 61 and sat 11 and a half games out of first place. So no one could have imagined that they were on their way to winning the pennant. The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. It's all over. The Mets have won it with a magnificent stress drive. Entering the season, the Mets were not considered to be a favorite in the race for the division crown but they did have some veteran talent. Players like Cleon Jones, Bud Harrelson, Rusty Staub, and Jerry Grody were proven commodities. The new second baseman was Felix Mion, and manager Yogi Berra's pitching staff looked to be one of the team's strongest in years. Well, we have a pretty good team, you know. Wasn't uh, real good, you know, but uh, well, they all pitched in that year. They really did. Don't forget, we still had a good pitching staff, though. You had Matt Lack, you had Kuzman, you had uh, Matt Tug McGraw, had uh, uh, Seaver. Uh, we had pretty good pitching then. Despite the presence of those great arms, the team got off to a horrible start thanks in large part to a rash of injuries to many of the team's key players. I look back at 73, first off at the beginning of the season we were scheduled to be about fifth in the division. Uh, after that, during the course of that season, I have never seen a club decimated by injuries much more than uh, that ball club. Uh, Milner was out for a while, uh, Willie was out for a while, Cleon was out, and um, Tug was struggling out of the bullpen. It was a mystery. It was really a mystery. Um, there were guys that uh, 
generally got off to good starts. Uh, generally had pretty consistent years all the way through. Cleon Jones, Jerry Grody, uh, Buddy Harrelson, Ed Cranepool. It was a fairly consistent group of guys. Um, it wasn't like the 69 Mets who were young and had tendencies to get hot and cold and all that sort of thing. This team was uh, relatively mature. And everybody, everybody was just staggering and stumbling and nobody could really get on track. By the All-Star break, the Mets had hit rock bottom, all alone in last place. It would be the turning point for the 1973 New York Mets. Once Buddy came back, once Jerry started feeling better, Cleon got into the groove, uh, something happened right around the All-Star break where everything started, to, every, all the pieces started to come back together again. And um, by, the, by August, we were, we were starting to, uh, we were starting to hit all cylinders. We were, our timing was there. We were, we were starting to cook. <laughs> The Mets were on a tear. McGraw, who had struggled all season, has 12 saves and 5 wins in his final 19 appearances. Jerry Grody, who missed 56 games, comes back to bat over 300. And Cleon Jones and John Milner return to give the team offensive firepower. By September 21st, the Mets had climbed to within a game and a half of the division-leading Pirates and were on the verge of completing the trip from last place to first. And a bouncing ball out in front of the plate. Grody has it. Throws the first and that's win it. The New York Mets are in first place. Grody pounced on the ball through the Milner. They're ganging Tom Seaver. It was an incredible finish for us. We won, I don't know, 21 out of 28 or something like that. And we won every uh, one of the series we had with the teams we had to beat. All that was left was to wrap up the division. The Mets would accomplish that on the final day of the season in Chicago. Fittingly, Tug McGraw was on the mound for the final out. Now the stretch by McGraw, the 3-2 delivery, the runner goes and a little pop-up. Milner grabs it, he'll run to first, double play, the Mets win the pennant. The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. It's all over, the Mets have won it with a magnificent stretch drive. I think that ball club, the last 30 days of the season, if I would look back at any period in my career where uh, I would say this was the best, uh, it would be the way that ball club that had struggled so much during the course of the year came together as a unit and played just with one cause. It wasn't an individual thing, it was to win. He's out! The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division! And a fight breaks out! A fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson. Buddy Harrelson. Buddy Harrelson. It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The pennant. In the marketing world, slogans can make or break a product. And in the sports world, they're often used to motivate or inspire. The Chicago Bulls' last dance is the most recent example of this. But in 1973, Mets reliever Tug McGraw unknowingly coined one of the most memorable phrases in New York sports history. It became a rallying cry for him and his Mets teammates. They won 19 and lost only 8 in September. They've won their first October ball game, and with it, they have won the pennant in the Eastern Division. Despite having a talented pitching staff and a veteran group of ballplayers, the New York Mets were underachieving in 1973. By the All-Star break, their inconsistent play, together with a slew of injuries to key players, had left the team languishing in last place. The club needed a spark, something to get the fire burning. That spark came in the form of Mets reliever Tug McGraw, who himself was mired in the worst slump of his professional career. Around the All-Star break is when we started getting healthy. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the team was struggling again and, and we were on a losing streak and the owner, M. Donald Grant, came down to have a meeting with us and uh, try to give us a pep talk. And uh, Mr. Grant was, um, you know, he's kind of an astute gentleman. Um, he wasn't the kind of guy that ballplayers really felt comfortable going up and talk to. 
He was a Wall Street kind of guy. And yet he came down and he thought it was important enough and in the context of his talk, he was saying how none of us would be there if the Mets family didn't believe in us. And I had had lunch, I think it was right around July 9th. I had had lunch with a friend of mine and I was trying to figure out where, where my head was. And uh, we came, at lunch we said, there's only really one thing, you have to start getting your confidence back, you have to start believing that you can win and you have to start trusting your teammates. If you do your job, you have to trust that they'll do their job. You can't worry about anything that they're doing. You just first have to get yourself on track. So I went to the ballpark with that attitude, and I was just doing that all the way to the ballpark. You gotta believe, you gotta believe, you gotta believe. And then during batting practice, I was doing it, and everybody was like, get away with me with that. Get away from me, you're making me crazy with that. And then and Donald Grant had his meeting, and in his meeting he says, you wouldn't be here if we didn't believe in you. And I jumped up and I said, that's right, you gotta believe. And before I could realize what I'd done, I'd rudely interrupted him. And you don't do that to him, Donald Graham. So uh, he cut his talk short and stormed out of the clubhouse. And my friend and, and roommate, Ed Cranepool, came up to me and he said, McGraw, you're out of here. I said, what'd I do? I was too fired up to know that I'd done anything wrong. He says, you just embarrassed and insulted and undermined the owner of the team. What is wrong with you? I said, what? I, I was agreeing with him. I mean, does, well, I'm the most misunderstood guy in the world here. And he said, well, you better do something about it. You better go up and apologize or explain yourself or something. Otherwise, you're not going to be here tomorrow. And I said, all right. So I got on the elevator and I went up to Mr. Grant's office and I asked him, I knocked on the door, asked if I could come in and he listened to me. He said, uh, I understand that you meant no ill will, but he said, there's only one thing that's going to keep you here. And I said, what's that, Mr. Grant? He says, you better start winning. <laughs> and so from that on, our team started to uh, roll along, and that became a rally cry. I don't know how much the players actually thought of it as a rally cry, but the media sure liked it, and the fans liked it. You know, things started to happen pretty good after that. The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. And a fight breaks out. A fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson. 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 It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The, the 1973 Mets had plenty of stars to rely upon. Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Rusty Staub, and Cleon Jones, to name a few. And if you look at their statistics, they're all worthy of being the most valuable player for that 1973 team. But there's one player from that team whose contributions shouldn't be measured in numbers alone. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. Arguably the greatest player to ever play the game, Willie Mays was in the twilight of his career in 1973. At the age of 42, Mays could no longer produce the way he had his entire career. But to many of his teammates on that Mets club, his presence in the clubhouse was undeniable. And the opportunity to put on the same uniform as the great Willie Mays was truly an inspiration. Willie was, Willie wasn't he was just a shadow of the player he once was, but his instincts were still there, and on certain days his skills were still, uh, you know, 95% of what they might have been in his prime, and you still still saw this greatness, and you knew that he played with some great ball players and against some great ball players, and I wanted him to remember me as one of the best players he'd ever been on a team with. And so every time I went out to pitch, I was pitching for the Mets, I was pitching for myself, I was pitching for every reason that we all play, but I was also pitching to, to leave a mark in Willie Mays' mind. That that guy knows how to pitch. And so, um, to me, and Willie Mays made us all feel that way to some degree. Maybe everybody not like I, but to some degree, we all wanted Willie Mays to think of us as some of the best baseball players he'd ever been associated with. Although Tug and his teammates had great respect for Mays, in the clubhouse, he was still one of the guys. Doug McGraw was a, was a funny kid. Uh, I used to wear a suit to, to the ballpark every year, a new suit, because I was with a company called Petrus Sully. And Tug would take a little knife and cut the suit up. 
<laughs> and then, no, he didn't cut a big hole in it, but he cut a little small one. And he'll come to me and say, Willie, what are you doing with that hole in your suit there? So I said, okay, you take it. So I would give it to him. So he got about five or six suits that way off of me. But he was a guy that would come to me and say, well, what do you need today? What do you need? And they'll come see, but what do you need today? You know, I don't need nothing. I just want to be here. It was just a, a, a warm feeling that I received that made me want to be there. In 1973, I quit. I went home, and I, that night, I got a call from uh, uh, Mrs. Joan Payson. You cannot quit. You could not stay away from the game. You, you just come back. And I said to her, I don't think I can play anymore. She said, that doesn't make any difference. The guys want you here. Well, I want you here. You just come back and be around with the guys. And that's why I went back. And that's how I continue playing in the World Series in 73. Willie Mays knew how to play baseball. I don't care if his knees were bad. I don't care if his eyes were going bad. I don't care, I don't care what. Willie Mays helped us get to the World Series. I hope that with my farewell tonight, you would understand what I'm going through right now. Something that I never feel that I would ever quit baseball. But as you know, it always come a time for someone to get out. And I look at the kids over here, the way they are playing, and the way they are fighting for themselves, tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. He's out! The Mets have just won the pennant in the Eastern Division. And a fight breaks out. A fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson. Buddy Harrelson. It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. With the march from last place on August 30th to first place on October 1st complete, the 1973 New York Mets turned their focus to the champions of the National League Western Division, the Cincinnati Reds. Well, the Cincinnati Reds in the, in the early 70s and into the mid-70s were the Mantra League, you know, one of the better teams to ever be put together. I think during that period, they were looked upon as, as the best team in baseball. And the Mets didn't have a tremendous offense. They had great pitching, pretty good defense. And going into that series, we felt very confident that we could beat them because of our pitching staff. And what we had to do was break through and score some runs. Uh, game one, it didn't happen. I mean, it was one-to-one -one in the ninth inning, and Seaver gave up a home run to bench, and it was over. In winning game two, which really the score was one nothing going into the ninth inning, the Mets scored a few runs. They scored four runs, I believe, in the ninth. We went home. We had won one game out of two in their ballpark. We were ecstatic. We felt we had the, you know, the, the, the Shea fans on our side. I think we started believing we were going to win it. Rusty Staub would be the hero of that third game in New York. A solo home run in the first gave the Mets a 1-0 lead. Two innings later, Staub connected for a three-run blast to stake Mets starter Jerry Kuzman a 6-2 lead. Later in the game, the Reds' frustration reached a boiling point. Ground ball hit down to first base. Milner has it, throws to Buddy Harrelson, one to first, double play! And a fight breaks out. A fight breaks out. Pete Rose and Buddy Harrelson, both clubs spill out of the dugouts, and a wild fight is going on. <laughs> Jerry Kuzman's in the middle of the fight. Everybody is out there. Buddy Harrelson and Pete Rose got into it. Rose apparently thought that Harrelson had done something in making the double play. Rose outweighs Harrelson about 35 pounds. Former Mets shortstop Bud Harrelson believes that remarks attributed to him following game two of the series were at the core of the incident. After Matlack uh, pitched a two-hit shutout, uh, he is on national TV. He is the, obviously the star of the game, and, and so all the national people got him on. Uh, so he stayed out of the field. We all left the field and came into the clubhouse. He's in the locker next to me. There's 50 riders there, and they said, what do you think about the big red machine today? And I said, they all look like me hitting. You know, that's kind of a knock on me. I was a light hitter, a defensive player. Here's the big red machine, two hits. Uh, we scored five runs, and uh, 
I thought it was a ho-ho, but when Pete Rose and some of the players in Cincinnati heard what I said, uh, they didn't take it lightly, and Pete Rose being uh, Charlie Hustle, and the kind of player he is, uh, used that to fire up the ball club, and uh, the word was out that, uh, you know, he was going to make me the guy that, that, you know, turned on that team. We were way ahead in that game, and Pete was trying to rally the troops. So uh, what better way to rally the troops than to pick on Huckleberry Finn, you know, the, the nice guy. And so um, he, took, he took in the second base and uh, kind of abused Buddy a little bit while sliding into second. And Buddy realized he'd just been abused and uh, kind of stood up to him. And Pete says, this is the moment I've waited for. He took him and just kind of lifted him up and gently laid him down and, and, and let, let the rest happen. And now, Buzzy Capra is in a fight. Capra's in a fight out of center field. Another fight breaks up. Actually, it helped fire us up, too. I mean, whenever, whenever you're an athlete and you take the risk of uh, doing something for the purpose of motivating your team, it's always a, it's always a um, you never know how the deal is going to turn out because it can motivate the other team just as much as it does your own. The Mets went on to capture Game 3 easily, but the Reds came back in Game 4 on a dramatic game-winning home run by Pete Rose in extra innings. In the fifth and deciding game of the series, New York builds a 7-2 lead going into the ninth inning. Starting pitcher Tom Seaver gets the first out on a line drive to Felix Mian, but then Seaver tires. The Reds load the bases with just one out, and manager Yogi Berra calls upon his bullpen ace, Tug McGraw. McGraw gets Joe Morgan for out number two, and New York is just one out away from the World Series. Pitch, swung on, hit on the ground toward first. Milner has the ball, looks to McGraw. It's over. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant. The New York Mets have won the pennant, and this is a wild scene. Fans are pouring out onto the field. A mad scene at Chase Stadium as the New York.